Hey everyone, this is Jim and Charles from Vals and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Live number 184, we're going to talk a little bit about the global inventory of vintage power tubes. Or the great mass extinction. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. Um, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so this is a very dour subject, and there's just no other way to describe it. For a couple of years, I've been warning tube lab viewers and customers that the inventory of quality vintage tubes was going down, and someday we would basically run out. Now, before anyone freaks out or races to their tube stash to make an inventory, let me say the world will never completely run out of vintage tubes. A thousand years from now, your descendants will still be listening to tube gear. Maybe more with modern manufactured tubes, especially if the quality will improve. And some even with tubes we currently have in stock in our inventory. But, and this is the big but, Inventory of many popular or commonly used vintage tubes are is now down to a point that you could call them endangered and they will eventually go extinct. So today what I'd like to do is go over the current market situ situation with vintage power tubes. They're the ones in the most trouble for the simple reason that power tubes just don't last as long as preamp tubes. Later on, we'll do an episode on the status of preamp tubes. There's so many of them, we might actually have to do more than one, but <laughs> we're starting with the power tubes. Yeah, and this will give you a sense of what's going on. Okay, so let's see what we've got out on display. So, one of the best vintage KT88s was made by the true St. Saint Petersburg plant in <laughs> I guess screwed that's that up. Svetlana in yeah. the true St. Petersburg plan. <laughs> yeah. I'm so fast I skipped ahead to my next thought. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um so um there's a couple of different logos, but they all have these square, sort of rectangularish um holes punched in the plate. And um, there are a lot of copies of these that are that were not, never made in the same plant. They're not the same tube. They don't last as long. They don't sound the same. These are wonderful KT88s. And they have been in short supply for a long time. And they are definitely now endangered. Now, if you already have a quad of these or any power tubes that you bought from us, we have an archive of testing data that goes way back years to the very first tubes that I sold. And with any luck, if you have a quad and you lose a tube, or even two tubes, there's a good chance that for a long while we'll have enough inventory that we'll be able to actually match a at least a replacement tube and, um, and bring your, your quad back to life. And, and this, is, of course, is why I highly recommend and have been doing so for years now to buy a spare power tube. So if you need a quad, buy a fifth tube while you buy the quad. I know it's an extra expense, but now you've got insurance. And the tubes aren't going to last forever no matter what. So when one of them goes, you want to have a replacement ready rather than the other three just being useless at that point. Yeah. Now... Not surprisingly, one of the best sounding vintage 6550s. The 6550 is just basically uh, the small brother to the KT88. So it's a lower powered version of the KT88. The technology is exactly the same, but because it's a little lower powered, you can see it doesn't need this extra big bulb and the extra mica at the top. It's a simpler tube, it's more affordable to build, and honestly, it's actually more reliable than the KT88 version. And being a little lower powered helps with that, I'm sure. And, and this is also a true um, St. Petersburg Svetlana. These are wonderful tubes, and um, they are also now, and I've sold 
a lot of them, probably thousands of them over the years, they are now also endangered, um, unfortunately. Um, now, occasionally, we probably will still make up some quads, one or two quads. Uh, I think we've been making up two or three quads of the KT-88s every year, and a few more than that of the 6550Cs. Um, and I want to show you really briefly, Charles said, oh, don't do it, but I have to do it. <laughs> there, take a look at this. Now, this is an Electroharmonix. So this is the new sensor's brand name, going way back, years. And the plant is in Saratov, Russia. See the round holes? So this is their version of the 6550. Hang on, let me get the right tube up. Uh -huh. Charles is watching over my shoulder. He's saying, no, don't do it. <laughs> so here you go. It's a very different tube construction. Okay. But uh, they also make these with the Svetlana brand. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what you have to watch for. So here you go. So have a look at this. There you go. So there you go. Now this is one of the Svetlana logos that, that the True Factory used. This is the big stylized S and this is the wing C. And you might say, what the heck does a C have to do with Svetlana? Well, in the Cyrillic alphabet, the C is a S. 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 So that's where the C comes from. So yeah, so watch out. You see round holes, it's not the real tube. Okay, let's move on to something a little bit more upbeat. I wish we could do, what, a song and dance routine? <laughs> Maybe. Or whistle some great happy tune. <laughs> you can whistle. Yeah. Anyways, Charles isn't up to it, I can tell. <laughs> um, so here is uh, EL34 um, that is still in stock. We still have good inventory of RFTs. These are, I would put them in my top three vintage EL34s. They're rock solid. They were well made. They're long lived tubes. And They're, thankfully a lot of them were made. A lot of them were made. They're, they are very reliable and they were rebranded by any, Literally everybody. <laughs> anybody you can name. The only company I think I haven't seen rebrand them was Mullard and Phillips. And Mullard and Phillips invented the EL34. And of course, had, had their a, own production. <laughs> had a lot of, they, they made probably the most EL34s in history mm -hmm. um, because they control the patent rights really closely. Anyways, there's lots of these in stock. We actually have more new old stock, I think, currently than used. They are great sounding tubes. So that is a good piece of news. Now, lately we've come across a really interesting problem. And I think it's because there's lots of noobs getting into tubes again. I saw this about three or four years ago and it's the cycle is happening all over again. We really, we actually had somebody, we sent two premium tubes with excellent testing numbers and one of them was rebranded and he got upset. Yep. <laughs> and, it's not the first time this has happened. But, but it doesn't happen very often. Anyways, he's shipping them back. He put a lock on the payment. <laughs> so um, should I refer to him as a past customer? Well. Yeah. So anyways, we're not very happy about that. But what is this? Well, it looks like a GE EO34. But in fact, this is an RFT. Let's see. I got another one here. There's a Siemens brand, and in fact, a lot of the RFT production was rebranded for Siemens. And if you don't know, Siemens was and is a huge electronics manufacturer, among other things. And they were big on tubes, and they were well known for high, high quality. So the fact that they're bringing in RFTs and rebranding them, and for a long, they actually made EO34s a long time ago. And I have a feeling they found the production costs were just too much. Yeah, and the ones that you find these days don't have a uh, a good um, good reputation for reliability. Ah, so they switched uh, bringing in all of their production from East Germany, former East Germany, the DDR, um, and just rebranded them, um, probably right at the RFT factory. Anyways, this is an RFT. Now, here's the big question. If a tube is rebranded, 
if it's exactly the same tube internally, the glass is the same, the gettering's the same, the base is the same. The only thing different is that it's got a different label on it. Maybe there's a little subterfuge in which they would put, I think last week we showed a, a mullard that was made in Blackburn, UK. But it had stamped on it made in Germany. <laughs> I think it said it made in West Germany. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, I shouldn't have fooled anyone, but it could have fooled a customs person back then. Anyways, is this tube worth less than this tube? Will it sound different? Uh, will aesthetically be different in your system. If you're sitting in your chair and your, your amp is 10 feet away, mm -hmm. can you even see the labels? Yep. Are the labels even visible? Are they pointed in the wrong way? So our point of view for years and years since I started um, in this business professionally is that the most important thing above all is how the tube performs. And if it's the same physical tube. And if it's the same physical tube. Because a lot of tubes have minor variations. Mm -hmm. And that... Now, if it's a very minor variation that is not related to the electrodes or the electrical performance of the tube, then I think that's acceptable. But if it's a variation in plate structure, then that's different. Th those tubes should never be matched up, in my opinion. Yep. That like like tubes should be matched with like, like tubes like tubes and Charles is brilliant at doing that and and if we matched vintage tubes based off their labels as well as their electrical parameters we would never be able to match them it, once in a blue moon we can get matched tubes that have the same labels on them same boxes same boxes but that is so incredibly rare and we take pride in putting those together if we can yeah but the fact of the matter is we we're trying to figure this out. And based on what we've seen over the years, we figure that maybe as many as 50% half of all tubes ever made prior to about 1982 are rebranded. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, I don't know what's going on with some of, some of these new customers, but I think they need to learn somehow that rebranding is just part of, of vintage tubes a part of vintage now, tubes. things are different nowadays with modern production although sometimes it's still hard to figure out where something actually came from yeah we just were looking at the 6550s yep. yeah. yeah but uh, with vintage tubes it's you have to look at the construction of the tube and nothing else because there's all sorts of weird labels out there that can throw you off so here is probably the greatest el34 ever made this is the mullard and you can see it's got its it's U.S. designation, the 6CA7. Nobody uses that anymore. The, the original number from, the, um, from Phillips Muller, of course, was the EL34. And um, what's it say down here? Can you see that, Charles? Made in Great Britain. Okay, so that's good. So it wasn't made in West Germany. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are XF2s. They were made from about... Um, uh, 1960 to 1973. I think I've seen a 73. I don't think I've ever seen anything late. In fact, the 73 date I think I saw was in the first few months of 73. And that was the end of probably the biggest production run of EL34s in history. There were a lot of these around, uh, even a few years ago, they were expensive. But the numbers of the Mullards have been dropping off rapidly, which is a sure sign that um, the uh, tube is now definitely on the watch list. On the way to extinction. Uh, I, or close to it. <laughs> there, there were so many of them made that I don't know if this will ever go extinct. If I'm blessed with a really long life, and you are, mm. you probably will still... We specialize in the XF2, and we've sold hundreds of them. So... I, I expect that you'll probably still be selling them in old age. Well, I don't know about that. I think we were imagining before that 50 years from now, we might be seeing a new old stock quad come up for Christie's auction or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for $10,000. <laughs> um, so, the, uh, and that leads me to a, another point. We don't hold back anything. No. Uh, we consider the tubes we listen to to be just available through our own inventory. We don't have a private stash. We don't hold the best tubes back. We've never done that. I remember years ago, somebody put a, a comment on top of one of my early videos calling me, uh, you know, a wanker and uh, 
uh, tube hoarder and all sorts of nasty things. <laughs> and I thought, what's he talking about? I don't hoard anything. I sell everything that we have. Yep. Hopefully. I cry every time the <laughs> Sylvania GTAs go out the door. <laughs> yeah, well, so we still actually, because we specialize in the Mullard XF2s, we still actually have a good, in, we have a bin of them. And we have a lot of good matched uh, quads, mostly new old stock, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting harder and harder. We we ship more than come in, and we've been watching this now for the last year and year and a half. So that means that the supply is definitely drying up with these tubes, um, and the prices just are getting crazy. Now, the good news on pricing is if we have vintage inventory that we bought uh, at affordable prices eh, these were never affordable uh, neither were these um, we're going to hold our price as long as we can mm -hmm. when we start to get these are we're really close to having to raise our price because um, uh, the cost of bringing these in and the loss that's another thing i wanted to mention as we get closer to um, very low inventories of certain kinds of, of tubes we're starting to see the rate of loss uh, due to um, poor testing, damaged tubes, noise, microphonics, uh, even dead shorts that electrocute the poor guy on the tester. Yeah, we're seeing more and more junk tubes being sold because the value of them is increased and people think they can still get something out of them even though they are junk. And there's some flim flam artists that have, there's more and more of them, particularly leading up to Christmas. It's really, I always put a warning up in the month leading up to Christmas to watch out because uh, they, they play customers for the sucker, unfortunately. Mm. And, and we're getting burnt more and more often, even though we're really careful. So, yep. man, and, you know, when we get burnt on a big wholesale purchase, there's a lot of money at risk. So, mm. um, anyways, um, don't make sure you have buyer protection. <laughs> anyways, the we're good for now with the Mullards. And... Tubes like this that we specialize in will be able to keep your quads and even your pairs going for probably for a long time. Hopefully, if we have a match, but we do have a decent spread of them, so. Yeah, yeah. It's not a guarantee, but that is going to be one thing that even though we may find at some point that we just simply don't have matched quads of these tubes, uh, we're going to keep bringing in singles and pairs yeah. and... You know, if a wholesaler has a dozen of them and none of them match, that's fine. We'll just bring them in. And uh, use them as spares, yep. Out of the dozen, we'll probably lose five or six mm -hmm. right off the bat just because they're not good tubes. And do we have a backdoor to selling uh, damaged tubes, microphonics tubes, used tubes, garbage? Well, no. The garbage is the garbage. I actually have... Both of us have big garbage cans beside our lab benches. And, and they fill up with tubes. They fill up with tubes. Yeah. It's a, it's sad to hear when Ch Charles does, I think, three quarters of the testing. <laughs> he'll, he'll hear a grumble from the next room over and a clink as another tube gets tossed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then on garbage days, it's, it's sad. Yeah. But that's life. Rather than take a chance that these tubes ever end up in the market again, we dispose of them. Okay. Last up is... The lowly 6v6, but a lot of people are running these in guitar amps. And we still actually have good inventory of the vintage Svetlanas. Now this is, you're thinking maybe it's the second generation 6v6? Uh, uh, roughly equivalent to, I believe, the 6v6 GTA. Right. This is made in 1955. I love Svetlana. You know, uh, when I first got in the business, I... we. We, we had a lot of Svetlana tubes that we specialized in, and we still do. Mm -hmm. In fact, the headphone amp that you're finalizing, we yeah. were, in fact, that's why we're late with the video today, because we were working hard on it this morning. It uses a Svetlana uh, power tube that we can, we still have cases of it brand new. And it's actually a nine pin equivalent to this tube right here. It's yeah. It's a nine pin 6v6. And it, it sounds. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> it's it's an amazing tube. The construction, the quality of construction, the sonics. There, I mean, we haven't burnt one out through stupid mistakes that we make. No, no. <laughs> so, anyways, we still have some of these. We have a good selection of used vintage North American uh, stock, 
but we don't have lots of pairs anymore. And they are now, the vintage 6v6s, I would say, are endangered. There are a lot of them out there, but a lot of them don't test good. And there's a lot of variety too, just like tubes like the 6SN7. There's it's, just so many versions that it's hard to match up. Yeah, huge, huge amount of variety. And most amps need at least a pair of them. So that's going to be a problem moving forward. But luckily, there still is some vintage inventory available. Okay. So it's not all bad news. And um, the, the, I think the takeaway from this is if you've got a favorite vintage power tube that you really love the sound of, and when you can afford to bring in a replacement spare, bring in a spare quad, bring in a spare pair, whatever you need, when, when you can, you're up to it financially, because the price is only ever going to go up and the availability is only ever going to go down. Yeah. And now is still actually a really good time because prices went up a huge amount a couple of years ago, right at the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, when the tube supply, modern uh, tube supply tightened up. Mm -hmm. And we, I had two months in a row in which I, I was almost killed. I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week for seven weeks straight <laughs> and it, um it, and at that point i sent a message to charles i, I was showing the stacks of, sh of boxes <laughs> going out and i said if you ever were thinking about joining the business you can have half the business but i i need you <laughs> yeah i need all of you 100 percent of you um and yeah and then you came so mm -hmm. that was that was great you you saved me <laughs> so and the business is just busier and busier so um, anyways, uh, so yeah, so we'll support, uh, tubes that we've sold to you as best as we can going forward. And we'll continue to try to match up as much of our favorite vintage power tubes as we can. We're always sourcing them. We're always bringing in singles and pairs and whatever we can find, but it, it just takes a lot to match them up. You yeah. Don't, you don't realize how many of these, like the KT88s you have to have around to get a match quad. Oh yeah. I, I often say you need two dozen power tubes to have a hope at matching up a quad. Yeah. I often get notes from people saying, I've got five or six mismatched tubes. I think I need to test them. What can I do? I'm like, you need another 20 tubes, dude. <laughs> and then you have a quad. So anyways and we used to actually test for free for customers as just a service you know i mean we could have charged but i don't want to charge for testing and then we just i just got so busy no we just don't have the time for we, it. we don't have the time we we will not we can't test for customers we can just barely keep up with our own business mm -hmm. anyways um charles you've got a couple of really uh nice tubes that came in and i'll clear the decks if you want to bring them over and talk about them sure okay All right, so I'm going to start off with this guy right here. Speaking of harder to find power tubes, we've gotten in some of these beautiful Sylvania EL84s. And these are getting harder and harder to find, just like all these other power tubes that are out there. The EL84, of course, is the sort of the little brother or cousin of the EL34. Designed for the same purpose, but designed to be more compact and lower powered. Yeah, and also um, invented, designed, invented by Philip Smullard, mm -hmm. and um, and it's a great sounding tube. And there's actually a, a, quite a few famous amps out there that use the EL84. lots of guitar amps and some hi-fi amps as well. Yeah, and um, so we were lucky enough to get in enough that we might be able to get a quad or two of these together. We still have to test uh, a whole bunch of them. But uh, hopefully, if we get those uh, tested later today or tomorrow, they'll be in the store on the weekend. Yeah, and like a lot of tubes, they come in a black plate version and a gray plate version. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, everybody wants the black plate. And honestly, I think it's just like the same with uh, vintage stereo equipment yeah. years and years ago. People, first, we had nothing but silver faces. <laughs> then it, black faces came in. Everybody wanted black faces. Oh, and look then, at that. It, lo it just looks sexy. I mean, it does. But, it's a nice looking tube. But interestingly enough, um, 
in most cases, the black plates are the early version and many manufacturers switched up to improve new formulas that were gray. Gray. Yep. <laughs> so uh, the, it's possible that the, the earlier tubes sound better, not because of the coating on the plates, but because in fact they're earlier tubes. That's often the case. It's also possible that people are preferring black plate tubes when they should actually be buying the gray plate version. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really, honestly, I've never actually heard a difference between an equivalent black and gray plated tubes. So yeah, I don't know if it's psychology, if there's anything to it. Maybe there's a certain tube in which it really applies. Maybe. It, it probably depends. Yeah, um, it, it does depend. Yeah, and, and for just like the um, the 6v6s, these are getting rarer, especially the American-made ones. Uh, but we do have a decent stock of the Soviet-produced 6p14p equivalent of these. Yes. You can still find those. We have fantastic matches of them, and they're still available in decent quantities. And they're very affordable. They're very affordable, yeah, especially compared to the vintage U.S. tubes. Yeah, everybody wants the Sylvania. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, this is a tube that used to be very, very common, eh, Charles? The, the <laughs> GE6SN7 GTB. Yep. Um, and caution, the early GTs um, and the early GTAs were just a bad, bad GE tube. Well, the GTAs, not so much. They actually performed quite well, but the GTs, were, the GTs. Just, were terrible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they... Yeah, <laughs> we, we have some here, and we're not even going to put them in the store. They, you know, ninety percent of them are noisy now. <laughs> yeah, and those are the ones that pass through the electrical testing. Most of them just went in the garbage. Yeah. Anyways, GE redesigned the tube, and I think they took such a hit in their market share um, that the, I'm sure that the 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 big bosses said, "Look, the, we're this is embarrassing. Nobody wants our tubes." Um, redesign this thing so it's it's robust, it works well, it sounds good, and nobody said make it look sexy. It's a pugly little tube. Yeah. But these are fantastic 6S and 7s, and we always recommend them as Catholic followers because they're just rock solid, they're very quiet. But and they're also great as voltage gain tubes too, so it's a it's a great it's, it's sort a, of dual 6S and 7. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we've been lucky. We found a bunch of new old stock ones mm -hmm. um, in these beautiful boxes. I mean, look at the the definition on the color here. When you see the blue G box, you know you've got an earlier type. Mm -hmm. And it's not faded at all. It's nice and bright. It's beautiful looking. Yeah. And yeah. it's nice to find them in boxes like this. Yeah, and the GTA actually looks exactly like the GTB. Um, in fact, the only difference between, in most cases in the 6S and 7 lineup between a GTA and GTB is the filament specification. Other than that, they're basically identical tubes. The GTB, I think, has a controlled heater warm-up versus uh, a less controlled heater warm-up with yeah, the GTA. Which so, really only mattered in series string filament setups and yeah. TV sets and things like so that. So for most people in their home uh, hi-fi systems and guitar amps, never with a 6S N7, never worry about whether you're buying a GTA or GTB. The only thing that you will know is if you did buy a GTA is that you've bought an earlier version of the type. And Guar typically guaranteed. they sound better. Typically they sound better. Yeah. So we have a fair number of these in stock, which these used to be, as I said, abundant. And now I would put the GE 6SN7 GTAs and GTBs on the watch list mm -hmm. because they are, they're drying up. People are, I mean, we sold thousands of them, I think. Um, and um, they're just not a commonly available tube anymore. So it's a, <laughs> years ago, we used to celebrate when we got in, you know, uh, Mullard XF2s and Svetlana KT88s. <laughs> now we're celebrating when some of the most common tube shows up new old stock. And you can still buy quite a few of these used, um, but finding them new old stock, testing good, that's tough. Okay, we we were actually yapping so long that um, <laughs> our, our data card decided that it was going to stop working, um, stop recording. So anyways, um, hopefully it wasn't such a negative day. And in fact, we have some discount codes to offer to help 
uh, brighten your day. <laughs> and people have been grabbing a secret code. Well, it's not a secret code, is it? It's a hidden code. I don't know if it's secret if we keep talking about it. Yeah, people have been grabbing a code. You can figure it out pretty easily. And we have um, flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.